Hello, welcome to the LaRouche PAC Weekly Report for May the 30th, 2012. I'm John Hofel, and joining me in the studio today are Matthew Ogden of LaRouche PAC TV, Jason Ross of The Basement, and Lyndon LaRouche. Good, Good morning, Lynn. Uh, we're going into the second phase of the discussion which we did last week. This time we're still back on uh, with, with Bach again, uh, but uh, also in terms of our dear friend. and. Uh, what we're going to be dealing with is the uh, physical principles which underlie music, and specifically that a Bach today added to our original schedule. And uh, there's one thing I'll add to this going into this. I've done it in the meantime, I've done a piece which is now completed, though it's not finally edited. You know, that's a little point I should report to you, is that uh, it's on the height uh, type of, of this physical principle of, of music, but also of science. And there were four errata in the third chapter of this, which has been published in print in the, in the site. And these corrections are just are minor. Two of them are actually corrections. One is just a routine co kind of correction. Uh, let me look at where I'm at, at right here. First of all, on there's a there are two corrections on what is page ten of the of my copy of this thing, uh, which uh, involves uh, excuse me just a minute. Uh, what it involves in the first case is there's a, a sentence I have there which this is to emphasize that when physical economic growth is the standard employed. And it should have read is the standard uh, n not employed. Uh, then the net physical growth of the economy has been consistently negative in direction since approximately the immediate aftermath of the launching of both the Warren Commission and the U.S. war in China. Mm -hmm. And there are other minor erratas. But the point here is is to get into this this process of understanding that we're not talking in Bach and. Or, in Furtwängler, we're not talking about just music as such. We're talking about universal physical principles of the human mind, and they are physically efficient principles of the mind, such that people who are who understand these principles are actually superior in their intellectual capabilities <coughs> and scientific cap capabilities to those who do not, mm -hmm. because there are all fundamental principles of physical science which are little understood these days because of the particular character of the educational process in, the, in, in universities and so forth presently. And fortunately, we have been, in terms of some of our operating members here, we have people who have skills in both these areas and are able to bridge the gap, apparently, between physical art as, and physical science. That they are the same thing. What this represents is what Bach represents and what Furtwängler represents is a leap into a higher dimension of physical science that otherwise exists. That is the ability of the human mind to understand the physical universe depends upon actually understanding the significance of the contributions of Bach first and of Furtwängler second. And people who don't like Bach and who don't like uh, <coughs> Him, him, uh, uh, are really not fully qualified in physical science, and this is therefore the second presentation at this table that which will have been done on this subject, and there will be a third one coming. Good, and that's precisely what I want to address today. Um, now, just to begin and to bring the proper amount of celebration to our <laughs> proceedings here today, I would like to extend my personal. Uh, congratulations to Keisha Rogers, and I think on the behalf of all of us, who has just won uh, her Democratic primary in the state of Texas in the 22nd Congressional District. This is, um, she was the Democratic nominee in 2010. She's again the Democratic nominee in 2012. And uh, may this be the first in a series of victories by the LaRouche National Congressional Slate. And also, may other congressional candidates take a page out of Keisha's book and realize that it's only by defying the dictatorship of the, uh, Obama, the Obama party 
that we can possibly save this country. So congratulations to Keisha, and also congratulations to those voters who defied the Obama party dictatorship uh, in the face of really vicious attempts to suppress the vote. So uh, I think on that theme, we can come back to the discussion that we had last week, uh, and maybe this time around we can class it under the heading defying the slavery of uh, the commitment to simple sense experience. And this is what we explored last week uh, through the, from the standpoint of uh, the Furtwängler principle, as we defined it, as a physical principle, not just of uh, classical art, but a ontological understanding of the physical nature of the universe itself. And uh, this week, as Lynn just said, I'd like to come around and revisit this Furtwängler principle again, this time a little bit more specifically through the personality of Johann Sebastian Bach, and especially how Johann Sebastian Bach was understood uniquely by Wilhelm Furtwängler. Um, now, this is something that is substantial, which can be heard immediately when somebody listens to the performance of Bach's music by Furtwängler. This is completely different, yet again, than the way that anybody else practically performs the music of Johann Sebastian Bach. Furtwängler, also some of the other artists that were uh, directly influenced by Furtwängler. You can listen to the performances of Edwin Fischer, for example, a great pianist who worked with Furtwängler um, and who recorded many of Bach's uh, keyboard works. But uh, I think the place from which to start in the same way that we emphasized this last week, is that just like Furtwängler, Bach was no mere musician. Bach was not just somebody who was uh, concerned merely with the uh, musical art as limited to that subject matter as such, but Bach was a scientist also in his own right, and um, whose highly developed understanding of a universal scientific principle, explicitly as such, uh, we hear as expressed in a very highly developed form in his works of classical musical composition. And it's not a coincidence, I think, that um, not only was Bach working for most of his professional life in Leipzig, which was considered the intellectual capital of Europe, at that time, the center of, of learning, also the center of publishing. Uh, it was called the little, the little Paris because of the level of culture that was uh, present among the general population of Leipzig, no matter who it was. And uh, it was saturated with the ideas of Gottfried Leibniz, who resided in Leipzig merely one generation before Bach. Um, we also know that Bach was directly influenced by the, um, not only the ideas, but the method of Johannes Kepler. And I think with both of these two scientists in mind, when we, when we look at the personality of Johann Sebastian Bach, you'll recognize that both Leibniz and Kepler are uh, the exemplary avenue by which we can begin to understand what Lynn has uh, described as the great principle of metaphor. When we understand, as we elaborated last week, that, for example, with Leibniz, uh, we can know that in none of the so-called finite created elementary things that we find in the universe, the things as such or even in the aggregate of all of those things, can we find the sufficient reason for their existence uh, that the causes of what we see, the causes of what we hear, the causes of what we sense do not lie in the objects that we sense? Uh, and then similarly in Kepler, that understanding that, that the, uh, the cause of uh, these finite things must lie outside and above in a substance which is superior to the shadows as such, that it's only through the disagreement of these shadows, the disagreement among these finite things, that we can come to see what's unseen and uh, escape 
the ghostly shadow land of our sense experience and step outside of those prison walls into the real world, which lies outside in what we call the domain of substance. So this is what was in Kepler. This is what was in Leibniz. And this is the profound scientific understanding that we hear through the music and the performance, the proper performance of the music of Bach. And so uh, it's this role as the father of all classical music, a real revolutionary as such, somebody who created, who introduced something which had not been understood in any physically efficient form before that time, uh, that changed the course of all artistic composition after Bach, and Furtwängler knew him as such. Furtwängler uh, described Bach as the Homer of music, the founder of this uh, science whose, he says, whose light shines through the musical firmament today and who, uh, in a very special way, we have not ever surpassed. He described him as a divine creator sitting on his throne above the clouds uh, who is beyond the reach, practically, of all others. Now, but a word of caution. This was not just mere empty admiration. And I think we hear through musical commentary today, uh, again and again, empty words. Admiration for Bach because of an admiration for an effect that's experienced, but the lack of an understanding of the cause behind that effect. That's not the case with Furtwängler. Furtwängler's admiration came from understanding the uh, scientific principle as such, with, which lay behind the, the work of Johann Sebastian Bach. And uh, just to give an example of that, um, in his writings, Furtwängler came to understand that the same principle of performance, which he associated with his own idea of the, uh, the, uh, the superior substance of the whole, which dictates the behavior of all of the parts, was absolutely the principle which lay at the root of the composition by Bach. So uh, this is, for example, in one of Furtwängler's writings about Bach, he compares him to some of the other contemporaries of the day who are skilled composers, including uh, Handel, a very skilled composer who, in fact, Furtwängler performed and did a brilliant job. You can hear the Concerto Grosso by Handel that's performed by Furtwängler in a way that you'll never hear it otherwise. But even, even with Handel, Furtwängler realized that in comparison with Bach, there was something still strangely arbitrary, strangely capricious about Handel's music as compared to the, what he described as the serene sureness of purpose, which runs through every work by, composed by, by Johann Sebastian Bach. And he identifies it uh, by saying, with Bach's music, we hear a concentration on the moment linked with an immense breadth of conception, richness of detail linked with a grandeur of overall vision, with its simultaneous view of the microcosm and the macrocosm, with its concern both with the here and now and with the ultimate goal, its union of what is close at hand and what awaits us in the future, Bach's music offers us an experience of the unshakable power of nature such that we find nowhere else in the annals of music. And so, as you can see, the principle of composition that Furtwängler uniquely understood as what lay at the root of Bach's music, uh, for example, in his fugues, becomes clear when we see it and hear it through the lens of the Furtwängler principle, as we elaborated it last week. I mean, think about what he just said uh, in terms of the macrocosm existing in every microcosm, the superiority of the whole over the parts, the reciprocally dynamic relationship between those parts and the whole, 
where the whole is always primary and always dictating the behavior of the parts, but you have a collision at each moment between these two. And this union of the here and now with what awaits us in the future, the simultaneous hearing with what's close at hand and the ultimate goal. That's how Furtwängler describes Bach's music, and that's what we experience through the Furtwängler principle as Bach's music is performed, always listening both from the present to the future, from the microcosm to the macrocosm, and always also simultaneously from the future, which is not yet physically experienced, to the experience of the present, from the macrocosm to the microcosm. And this is the same, obviously, as what Furtwängler described as the Naherin and the Fernherin, the hearing of what's near and then the listening to what's far, intersecting at each moment of the experience performance. And so through Furtwängler's view of Bach and the application of the Furtwängler principle as a scientific principle, we escape this prison of sense experience and we defy the kind of simplistic notion of absolute space and absolute time as such. And this is, uh, from the standpoint, we can begin to understand that you have a knowledgeable principle of universal creativity, which Furtwängler clearly uh, elaborates as the um, uh, Bach as the architect of a universe in and of itself, but in the reflection as a mirror of the creator of the universe as such. Okay. And this is clear in the question of preludes and fugues in Bach. Because the p question that you're pointing to is this question of what is priority? Now, from a standpoint of physical science, which is where I'm approaching this thing, mm -hmm. right, is that you actually, you are proceeding in reverse order. That we take dead objects. There's the first category of, 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 of organization. Dead objects, dead planets, dead material. Then you have another thing, the live thing, human beings, animals even. Huh? <coughs> so you have the animal life which is a living as opposed to dead. Mm -hmm. Then you have a third category, which is the human mind, which actually is able to see the future in itself. Okay. So th th what happens then, you have an auto. Everyone assumes that the category of, uh, you know, chiefly, cheap, cheap, El Cheapo. Says it. But we have uh, dead things. Right. Uh, we have living animal forms of animal life all kinds. Then we have human life. The difference is fundamental. First of all, they are dead things. Mm -hmm. Secondly, and which some people never understood, they were always trying to find life in dead things. And that doesn't exist. Life is a principle of the universe. The, the problem here is really fascinating when it comes to this. The assumption is that first there were dead things. Mm -hmm. Then there came life in the form of what we call animal life. Thirdly, there's human life. Hmm? Mm -hmm. And they assumed that, that you got living processes in, in embryo out of dead things, hmm? and that you, from the living processes, which couldn't think, mm -hmm. actually think as humans can think, you would get human beings thinking. So they would assume that if you wanted to start a universe, you'd start with dead things, and then somehow you cook dead things until they become living things or of animal life. Then you cook human beings uh, out, out of animal life. Uh, you put the chicken in the roast and it becomes a human being. <laughs> well, this is obviously a little bit screwy, isn't it? So the, the fact of the matter is that contrary to this common conception of ordering, it is in the opposite direction. Now, how can you prove that? Well, there are many ways to prove it. But in the case of this context of music, it's elementary. The process of creativity, of human creativity, is the highest form of existence of life known to us. So therefore, you, and you don't get life out of non-life. And you don't get human life out of animal life. They come in a different order. Human life is the highest form. Now, hum, what we call human life 
we think of human beings. Uh, fine. But is it restricted to human beings? Is not this higher form of life existing in the universe? Is man not therefore a descendant of the universe rather than the other way around? Uh, is not th then animal life is real life. It's a product of life. But like life, products of life, such as animal life, you, know, you also get a higher form somewhere in this universe. We recognize that it's happening because the universe is organized in a certain way which reflects intelligence of the type we call human intelligence. And therefore, we are merely a variety of this higher form of intelligence which we share as in principle with mankind as distinct from the beast. Now, what do we do to put this from the standpoint of Bach and then put, it, put this again from the standpoint of, of Furtwängler? What's the result? You, know? you, you realize that what Bach represents is a higher form of life than people who don't like Bach. <laughs> For example, you just want to make the point a little bit cruel. Right? But, but we, if we understand that sort of thing, that mankind is the highest form of organization of life as we know it in the confines of this planet. But there, may, there must be in the universe still higher forms of life than we represent. And the animal is simply something which was popped in in the oven, so to speak, on the way to producing human beings as a reflection of this high, still higher form of life, which we know is man, the mental creative powers of mankind. Now then, what we call scientific discovery. The discovery is a principle as opposed to a mechanical innovation. All principle discoveries have the same characteristic. Mm -hmm. The idea of a principle, a principle of nature belongs essentially to this category, that mankind is a, reflects a special kind of principle of nature which reflects this higher form. Now, therefore, what's the significance of Bach? The significance of Bach is the Bach fugue is based, in the, as I said in the preludes and fugues, is based precisely on this concept of a transvaluation of valuations. Mm. Mm. Therefore, Bach is expressing this form of human intelligence as distinct from a kind of mechanical attempt like an animal imitation of human intelligence. Furtwängler right. uh, makes this very explicit. And he does it with, with great free passion, uh, which, because he rests upon not only Bach, but he rests upon the work of followers of Bach, uh, such as Mozart, Haydn before then, and Beethoven. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So therefore, the, the great composers who precede Furtwängler in his work are <laughs> reflections of this process. So when we say we, we like music, that's kind of silly. We admire what the universe represents mm -hmm. and admire man's role in the universe and admire it as something which we have to admire, we're obliged to, to admire and to emulate. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the, you have the problem that people, who, the have-nots, mm -hmm. and you have another fact that in terms of European civilization, that European civilization has degenerated under the influence of the opponents of these musicians. Okay. Right? That the, the, the intellectual life of the typical citizen of the United States of Europe is I inferior to that of their ancestors, of the relevant ancestors. There has been a moral and intellectual degeneration of human life and, and activity, which the thing we're fighting against is this degeneration. Uh, and it would happen, you saw it in music, you saw the, the opposition to Bach, the opposition to Beethoven, and then the, the attempt to exterminate uh, those who went further, right. like Furtwängler. Furtwängler was the campaign of extermination. They took a man in Germany who had been the Umpa band director, best loved uh, by, the, by the Nazi party. Um, and they took Furtwängler, threw him in the rubbish bin, 
and took this Oompa band. He used he I would conduct a symphony by stopwatch at the podium. He was caught by the by the <laughs> members of the orchestra. Mm -hmm. Cocked, clock stop. Uh, no, stop. And he had he was he was an official member of the Nazi Party. He had two membership cards yes, right. to the Nazi Party. So you had a real what the what the British did, the liberals did, mm -hmm. and the German liberals did, is they replaced a human com conductor of music with a fascist, a Nazi conductor of music, and he this Nazi conductor of music and all the people who liked him and liked the way he did things mm -hmm. were Nazis. Not because they joined the Nazi party, but because they had a state of mind which is specific to the same thing as the Nazi party mind. <laughs> and the British, of course, are richly endowed with that same Nazi kind of mind. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, they sort of invented it. <laughs> it's called the principle of the Roman Empire, is a British version. Right. So that, that's the point, this, that when we don't have this understanding of things which are typified by the classical music composition of Bach and of Fritz Wengler, we really are, do not have music, and we do not have the competent development of the intellect. The, in, the human intellect in, the, in, say, the 20th century has, in my lifetime, degenerated. And I can trace the degeneration to what happened during the 19th century in the so-called romantic movement mm -hmm. in music. And the Romantic movement was a form of decay which got to stink more and more as it got older into the 20th century. Right. But this is what the issue is. This is not just what is good music. This is what is good human, mm -hmm. good human thinking. If you're not, a class, if you're not really steeped in classical music, music, you do not know what humanity is. Because the very essence of the ability to perform a Bach fugue say from the Clay Preludes and Fugues, and to understand what the distinction is of the change from the first book and the second book. Mm -hmm. Then you go to what Furtwängler was arguing. You go to the work of the way the changes in composition developed by Mozart, mm -hmm. which, which Haydn was astonished by, it, uh, the, what the accomplishments of Beethoven, yeah. which would have astonished Mozart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and then you, now you get what Furtwängler represents. He represents a reflection a determined reflection as a great scholar, as a great thinker, as, among, as well as a great musician, right. represents this. But this is not just music. This is the way the mind must work. This is why you must use the classical mode in, in composing prose, mm -hmm. because you must, it, you must it generate within the po prose itself. This becomes clear on the question of dramatic presentations on the stage. The great cl classical works presented on stage are qualified because they compel the performers as a, a group of people to interact on the basis, same basis, the principle of the future. Mm -hmm. you know, the, what, you, you take, what is the great drama? It shows a principle of the future. Then you look back at this stuff and you, you see, well, it works exactly that way. Mm -hmm. And therefore, this is a quality, which if you want to have an intelligent community, a community of competent scientists, a community of competent thinkers, of common saints, but what, what, are we, what does humanity require? What have we lost? Huh? We have lost the connection to the future. We don't understand the future. We don't think the future. Mm -hmm. We don't think living processes. We try to d d deduce from dead things what man must be. But the key thing for humanity is we have to, the purpose of humanity is the future. We have to generate the future by ourselves. And by degenerating, by generating the future, we are creating what may, distinguishes mankind from the beast. Mm -hmm. People who like rock music are beasts. And they demonstrate it every time they open their mouths or whatever other author organ they open up for these, for these kinds of performances. <laughs> and the purpose is to enable the development of the human being to become a truly creative human being, which is the only human being. And you see this reflected in, particularly in Bach and, 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 and in Furtwängler. Because the question is, what is the inspiration, the sense of the future, a thought of the future, to generate the future on stage, 
to generate the future in the mind of the personality, which is called creative invention. Mm -hmm. Hmm? And these are, the, these are the issues. So we have come into a society which is intrinsically morally de decadent, morally degenerate. And its social values, its popular sense of popular things, its ad admiration of popularity. What is popularity? It's death. Because everyone goes there. You become dead. Therefore, you're popular. Because you do not challenge the present with the future. Therefore, you're not really human. You only come as a human being in the box. But when you open the box, there's no human being there. There's just a re re remnant of what was once the intention to create a human being. And it's what you get. This, you get this sense which comes out in this forward and, and future, um, the future and the past in, in, in Bach and in Furtwängler. It's exactly that. Uh, is that we have to find in ourselves an anticipation of the necessary future and to act on that basis mm -hmm. and to create a future as opposed to a repetition of the past. Mm -hmm. And thus this is not just music. This, this is something much higher. This is a devotion to mankind and mankind's future. This is the only thing that distinguishes us from the beasts. And you want to doubt that? Look at what you see on the streets now. Look at what you see in these young kids on the streets now. Yeah. Look at what you would see in our <coughs> political leaders. The political leaders of the United States, with very few exceptions, are intrinsically cowards of a special kind. They don't challenge the future. They play it safe by being stupid, dumb, clumsy, failures. Look at them. Look at the leading, the leading politicians, the leading political figures of the United States. They're all a bunch of stinking cowards who have no sense of the future. They have no sense, oh, I'm not, that's not for me. That's not for me. I'm not going to go there. That's not established. That's not accepted. I'm not going to go there. Huh? They, are, they are the living dead. They are committed intellectually to be dead. Most of our leading politicians are that. I mean, the, you see that. I can go by name. Yeah. I can prove the case, case by case. I mean, our leading politicians. The problem is they are morally dead because they have no commitment to the future. Mm -hmm. yeah. They don't hear the voice from afar. They don't enter the future. I don't go there, they say. You may be right, but I don't go there. You may be right, but that's not popular. I'm not going there. You know, and just to make the point, I mean, the moral principle as a musical principle, you know, um, Furtwängler himself was famous for this, that after a performance, although it was, you know, he criticized this, the cult of personality around the, the, the conductor. Everybody would go and want to have a society evening and everything, and he would slip out the back door and he'd be walking home at night in the dark streets thinking about what he had just done. He rejected all popularity. And he said the same thing about Brahms, that Brahms, although he was a very sociable person and really liked people, uh, when it came down to uh, praise and admiration and talking about his music, he, he hated it. He, he would shut down and he would block that out because he, as Furtwängler said, Brahms always lived every moment of his life with the future, with eternity in mind. And that's a moral principle. Brahms was one of the last of those in the 19th century even. And then after the death of Brahms and over the course of the, the uh, cynical 20th century, we've lost that sense of even the human principle of living for eternity. You see that in, uh, in also in physical science, the same development. Mm. Einstein reflected that. Planck expressed that specifically. Mm -hmm. And others who follow them expressed that. Yeah. Mm. Now, this is, it, it is in science, and that's what we've lost in science. That's why science has gone dead in performance, that we put things together still. We make gigantic things, which based on principles we've known, like thermonuclear fusion. Yeah. We've known that for a long time. Now we use it as a threatened weapon to destroy mankind. We don't think about going into space with such power. 
Right. We haven't gone to Mars. We should have gone to Mars already. We could have gone to Mars already. Uh -huh. well, we didn't use it. And the only way to go to Mars is actually to develop a thermonuclear system, a propulsion. Mm -hmm. And you need the thermonuclear technology also in order to transform the territory of, of Mars to make it somewhat livable <laughs> so that mankind o can operate there. We haven't done that. Mm -hmm. We haven't even thought about that. And that's because we've lost this sense of the future, which is the characteristic symbol of the future is what you see in Bach. <coughs> that's the future, the principle of the future. Because to, in order to solve the problem of how do you find the future, how do you compose, like Bach, mm -hmm. that's, the, that's based on the future. How do you compose and perform and direct, like Furtwängler, that's the future. So the, the, this is not just music. This kind of music and this conception of poetry, which is as far as the same thing, is the point that if you want to live as a human being, be a mensch. <laughs> Join the future. Get into the future. Be part of building the future. Yeah. Be a mensch. Endlich. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's an existence in the future. Like People who can't understand how the future differs from the past in a way that's different than just being the opposite aren't going to be able to understand you know, this, this musical question, aren't going to be able to understand science. Because, um, you know, it just... The, the correlation between this and then what Riemann did, where, I mean, he, he definitely saw development as primary. He saw creativity as the primary substance, not the present, but what the, what the, the direction, the creation of the future. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was what was most real. And obviously that means that you're not building the future. You're not, you didn't build the present from the past. You didn't build it up from pieces. There's something that's drawing you from the future. And um, in terms of getting beyond the senses altogether. Because you have, I just, I just want to take up as an example, going back to, to Riemann's habilitation dissertation, which is you know, like the, the key work in, in physics of the, of the 19th century, where it's like you take a, they have to go into a little bit of geometry to sort of set the stage for this a little bit. But you know, uh, in Egypt and Greece, people studying you know, the relations between shapes and things like this started to develop you know, a, whole, a whole geometry of different axioms and conclusions and things like this. What ended up happening was people were seeking for the most basic assumptions from which everything else would follow. That ended up being Euclid's approach, where Euclid took all of the discoveries of Greek science and then sort of turned it into a, he formalized it. And formalism is evil. Because instead of presenting discoveries as where they came from, from the process of mind that created them, he said, no, we're gonna start with sort of basic geometric hypotheses and show how everything actually follows from geometry rather than from the mind. So in laying out his basic uh, definitions and axioms and whatnot, one of them, the fifth postulate, was caused a lot of trouble for the future. Th this is basically the one that says that you can have parallel lines. It's possible to have two lines that just go next to each other and will never meet even if you extend them infinitely. Now, obviously, no one had ever checked. No one had gone to infinity to see if this was right. <laughs> and you can, you know, and it's actually not true. Uh, take for, let's say you had a city where the streets were laid out in, in an east-west grid, and you and a friend are on parallel streets and you're both going north. Now, if this city covered the entire Earth, what are, what are these streets going to do at the North Pole? They're going to meet. So on a sphere, for example, you'd can't, there are no parallel lines on a sphere. The, um, the same thing is the, is the case of space. So in the, you know, in the 1700s and the 1800s, people like Lobachevsky, Bolyai, and Carl Gauss <coughs> realized that you could create geometries that didn't start from Euclid's uh, presumptions, that didn't start from the idea that you could have parallel lines, that space was flat. They created other geometries. Lobachevsky created one where you could have multiple parallel lines, you know, and they, none of them would reach. He even got uh, Bessel, the astronomer, to help him test out whether this was true by making astronomical measurements to see if space was curved or not. Um, he wasn't able to determine it. But in contrast to these guys, well, not Gauss, but Lobachevsky and Bolyai, they were what you might call non-Euclidians. They said, Euclid made these presumptions, and I don't agree with all of them. This one I don't agree with, and I'm going to make another geometry while changing this one assumption that he made. Riemann said, no, the problem isn't in having a wrong geometric assumption. The problem is starting from geometry in the first place. You're basically starting from perception, from appearances, from relations in space, as opposed to starting from physics. 
So Riemann worked out fully the total generality of different curved spaces. This is the work that was later used by Einstein in eliminating space and time as concepts with his theory of general relativity. But Riemann said, forget, forget geometry. The only way you're going to provide a real foundation for understanding the relation of these things is in physics. What are the principles that cause everything to occur? That's the basis for understanding their relations. What made them come about? That's what they, you have to look at everything in terms of what made it. That, that's what it actually is. The thing with that is this anti-Euclidean approach, where the whole outlook of Euclid is rejected by Riemann, you end up realizing that there's no actual answer to this question. There's no final answer to the shape of space, because we're never done. Physics isn't done. There is no second law of thermodynamics. There's an unending density of development that lies in store for us in the future with the discoveries we have yet to make of principles which are currently, although unknown to us, governing, uh, governing the processes that we see. Like right now, the unexplained quantum processes or life or a number of other things. So the fact that we're never done also means that our activity is itself a principle of the universe. You can't say, I'm going to study the universe outside of human beings, because what we do shapes it. When we make new discoveries, we literally are changing the shape of space. We're bending it. Take that and look at the problems of thinking in terms of money. Because there's, you know, people, there's obviously our monetary, our financial system right now is disintegrating as we speak. But there are some people who are seeking for a different monetary system to replace it. Some of them even call it a credit system without knowing what the word means, where they say it's a different relationship of, of money. But the problems we've discussed with using money in an economy, you know, the foolishness of even the term monetary economics, of the fact that money isn't able to distinguish this, this sort of specific new liveliness that's embodied in a new physical principle, money isn't able to understand qualitatively the introduction of fire or agriculture or nuclear power or, the, or space technology, that the inability of money to understand that is the same thing as what you get with trying to make a geometry based on things as opposed to principles. So under a credit system, we're not going to have a final, we're not going to have a final credit system. It's not possible to lay out, uh, you know, what rates of interest should be, how the banking sector should work, and everything in a way that will be un unlast, you know, everlastingly eternal, because it's always based on what your specific intentions are. Right now, NAWAPA and space, for example, space defense and Mars, these are goals that are going to change in the future as we develop. So uh, it reminds me of this, uh, I don't remember where in the Republic it comes up, but at a certain point in, in, the, uh, in the Republic by Plato, you know, everybody's discussing the, the ideal republic, and they start thinking about, okay, well, how are we going to make sure that this republic continues into the future? How are we going to lay down, uh, you know, a basis for future generations to maintain this republic that we're creating? And they realize that no set of specific rules will work, both because people in the future aren't going to know why would those be good rules. And they, they end up coming to the conclusion that their process of deliberation is itself the only enduring foundation for, for, a, for an ideal republic, that future generations have to rediscover what the principle of the future is and improve upon it. So I think that, that that's something that people, it, it, gets, it gets scary to think about with a credit system, <coughs> is that there is no outside, non-human system that we're going to create that will then govern economy. It's, economy is a lively thing. It's a human thing. And human intention has to be there all along the way. Um, be all, they're all along the way uh, guiding it. The question then is, is what is the limit of mankind in terms of development of the universe, They're changing the universe, changing the rules, extending the rules? Well, we have the question of matter antimatter conceptions, which is the so-called boundary condition today of what we think the physics boundary condition is in terms of speed of, speed of this, speed of that, speed mm -hmm. of that. But then we, f we say that's impossible. And we just haven't created it yet. When we think about what we have to do with galactic systems, for example, the things happen there that uh, we're not conceiving of doing from Earth, but there's a part of the universe in which things are happening which don't fit the matter-antimatter convention. 
when you start to think about the time, the time factor. Well, we've blown up the time factor totally with, with uh, some nuclear fusion. But yeah. time, the clocks don't mean anything in the same way anymore. Right. And when we get to matter, antimatter, and we look at the universe, we look at matter, antimatter, we just stare at it. And, and to see that's a boundary condition. Hey, we're, we're locked here forever. What, we're in a dungeon. Well, it's a self-created dungeon. You didn't get the key yet to get out of it. Huh? Because obviously, when you look at, this, at the, uh, the cosmic system as a whole, you see ratios of time, action, and so forth there, and bounding conditions there, which go way beyond matter, antimatter, as it's simply defined. Matter, antimatter is actually a general principle of many kinds of matter, antimatter. Many stage, qualitative stages of development, matter, antimatter. We are already yearning for that. Once we start thinking about the limits of our universe as we know it, about the solar system, then we go into beyond the solar system and we go into the galaxy, and we sit there and we look at our charts and we find out how many million years do we go back in this process? How is this system put together? How do these changes organized went together? So we have, we have with matter, antimatter, we have a definition of a, an assumed limit on based on the assumed assumptions of experiment that you have now. But we are now getting into the matter-antimatter function much more familiarly as something which ex ex does extend further. And we know that this is cognizable by, my, by the mind of man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that fact, it tells us that's where we're going to go. Yeah, the, the sense of finality is more of sort of a psychological quirk than anything you get from actual science. I mean, people have, in the past at all sorts of times have said we're basically done. You know, what we've got right now, we can't imagine anything beyond it. Well, of course not if you're just looking in the system of what you know right now. But, you know, it's, it's through the cracks that you're mentioning with the, in, the, in astrophysics right now, things like this. There's plenty, there's plenty to discover that's out there, and it's just an intention to go ahead and do it. I mean, we could have had fusion energy by now. If there, you know, if there was a, an intention to make it happen, well, we have the intention there's a to political have, will to have find the final answer to all questions. <laughs> That's a very barbaric concept of a universe. <laughs> Sounds like an indecent uh, desire. It is intrinsically very indecent. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I do think that's the key. As you mentioned, we're sitting here right now in the midst of a breakdown crisis, which, uh, you know. Nobody who calls himself a professional economic forecaster saw it coming, mm -hmm. except for one. And the question is, how are you going to be able to develop the ability to think like Lyndon LaRouche and uh, carry this civilization out of the, the fallacies that were embedded in how we got, reached this point right now? You have to adopt that as a question. Is that simple? Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fungible question. And it's, 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 it's very possible. The barrier standing between us and that is this uh, refusal to defy the slavery of trust and sense experience. Yep. Yep. It's internal. Yep. Exactly it. And we've got further to go, but we're going to get that into the next week. Good. All right. Well, that will wrap it up for this week. Thanks for watching. Uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs>